Good evening. My name is Michael Levitt, and I'm the President and CEO of Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies. We are gathering this evening from across Canada and around the world to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day. This solemn anniversary of the over 6 million Jews murdered by the Nazis comes at a time when in Canada and around the world we are dealing with the threat of resurgent anti-Semitism. Tonight, as we join together in an act of remembrance for the lives lost, we also gather to reaffirm our resolve and our commitment to never forget the lessons of the Holocaust. At FSWC, our mandate of fighting hate and anti-Semitism through advocacy and education is more pertinent than ever. We are dealing with the daily social, political, economic, and personal struggles of a global pandemic while watching incidents of anti-Semitism and Holocaust revision and denial continuing to rise, not just in Canada, but globally. We are incredibly pleased to be partnering with so many incredible organizations as part of tonight's event. Please allow me to name each and every one of these organizations and thank them for all their efforts. Our synagogue partners include Beth Emeth, Beth Radom, Beth Ryan, Beth Shalom, Beth Tikva, Beth Sedek, and Kiever Synagogues, the Center for Holocaust Education and Scholarship at Carleton University, Halton District School Board, Hamilton Wentworth and Hamilton Wentworth Catholic District School Boards, the Israel and Golda Kashitsky Center for Jewish Studies at York University, Liberation 75, Shadowlight, the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, and the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center. As we begin with our ceremony this evening, let us remember the poignant words of Simon Wiesenthal himself. Freedom is not a gift from heaven. You must fight for it every day of your life. Thank you for joining us to commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Today marks the 76th anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp one of many camps that destroyed life through a process of industrialized murder. From each camp that was liberated came testimonies from survivors of unimaginable horrors alongside immeasurable suffering and losses. In the spring of 1944, my father, then a 16-year-old boy, together with his grandmother, mother, and five younger brothers and sisters, were deported from their home in Maud, Hungary to the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. All of them, with the exception of my father, was murdered together with the entire village of Maud, Hungary. Today, we remember those Jewish citizens who survived the Shoah, along with those who lost their lives to a hateful and intolerant ideology. In the spirit of Simon Wiesenthal, and his belief in justice for all. We remember the non-Jewish victims targeted during the Holocaust because of their race, ethnicity, sexuality, religion, and social and political beliefs. Today, we light six candles to commemorate those lives impacted by hate and intolerance. If you can, will you please join me in standing as we ask Holocaust survivors from across Canada to light six candles.
and please remain standing as Cantor Moses from Beth Shalom Synagogue recites the Kaddish, the Mourner's Prayer. Yit Kadal, Yit Kadash, Shemay Rabbah, Vyama Divrach Hirute, Vyamnik Makute, Vichai Chon, Vyame Chon, Vichaye the Chol Beit Israel, Bagalau is man Karib in Ruamain. Shemay Rabbah Mimorach, Vyamah Vyamah Maya, Yit Barach, Vyit Tabach, Vyit Faal, Vyit Romam, Vyit Nasay. Beit Adar, Beit Ale, Beit Halal, Shemei de Kudsha, Brichu, Leila, Min Kol, Birchata, Veshirata, Tush, Vechata, Menechemata, Dam, Iran, Be'arach, Be'iru, Amen. Yehesh, Lama, Rabba, Min Shemaya, Medechaim, Aleinu, Be'al, Hol, Israel, Be'iru, Amen. Ose, Shalom, Mimromav, Please be seated. One and a half million Jewish children were murdered in the Holocaust, lives that were cut short before they even had a chance to live. The following two poems were written by children who tried to capture some sense of their lived experiences. The child author of the first poem, Terezin, didn't record his or her name. The second poem, however, The Butterfly, was written by child author Pavel Friedman. Terezin, the heaviest wheel rolls across our foreheads to bury itself deep somewhere inside our memories. We've suffered here more than enough here in this clot of grief and shame, wanting a badge of blindness to be a proof for their own children. A fourth year of waiting, like standing above a swamp from which any moment might gush forth a spring. Meanwhile, the rivers flow another way, another way, not letting you die, not letting you live. And the cannons don't scream, and the guns don't bark. And you don't see blood here, nothing, only silent hunger. Children steal the bread here and ask and ask and ask. And all would wish to sleep, keep silent, and just to go to sleep again. The heaviest wheel rolls across our foreheads to bury itself deep somewhere inside our memories. The butterfly, the last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow. Perhaps if the sun's tears would sing against a white stone, such such a yellow, is carried lightly way up high. It went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks I've lived here, penned up inside this ghetto. But I have found what I love here. The dandelions call to me and the white chestnut branches in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here, in the ghetto. May I begin by commending the Wiesenthal Center, its president and CEO, Michael Levitt, its many partners for organizing this timely and significant commemorative event. For we meet at an important moment of remembrance and reminder of witness and warning, of the remembrance of horrors too terrible to be believed, but not too terrible to have happened, of the Holocaust, as Professor Elie Wiesel put it 
as a war against the Jews in which not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were targeted victims. Of the Holocaust as a paradigm for radical evil as anti-Semitism is a paradigm for radical hate. And meeting on the 76th anniversary of the liberation of the death camp Auschwitz, the most brutal extermination camp of the 20th century. 1.3 million people were deported to Auschwitz. 1.1 million of them were Jews. Let there be no mistake about it. Jews were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism did not die at Auschwitz. It remains the bloodied canary in the mine shaft of global evil today. And as we've learned only too sadly and too well, that while it may begin with Jews, it doesn't end with Jews. Regrettably, we are witnessing a resurgent global anti-Semitism, a pandemic of anti-Semitism old and new, without parallel or precedent since the end of the Second World War. It is particularly important, both symbolically and substantively, that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has joined us for this historic commemorative event. It is my special pleasure now to introduce to you the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. Hello everyone, bonjour à tous. For starters, thank you to the French and Wiesenthal Centre for Holocaust Studies for hosting this event on International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And a special thank you to my friend and your new CEO and President, Michael Levitt. Because even though we still need to be apart, it's incredibly important that we mark one of the darkest periods in human history and find a way to remember all those we lost. No matter where we are today, we pause to remember the victims of the Holocaust. We mourn and we pay tribute to the six million Jews who were murdered and the countless others who were victims of Nazi atrocities. We honor their memory by doing everything we can to make sure that such tragedies never happen again. And it's up to each and every one of us to preserve their memories and their stories for future generations. That is our collective duty. I want to thank the Centre and their partner organizations for the important work they're doing on this. By sharing the stories of the Holocaust with our children and grandchildren, we're making sure that they know the consequences of inaction and how far anti-Semitism, hatred, racism and xenophobia can go. This lesson has never been more important, because 76 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, Jewish communities around the world are being confronted with a rise in anti-Semitism. On n'a qu'à penser au geste ignoble qui a été fait envers la congrégation Char Hashomayim il y a deux semaines seulement à Montréal. L'antisémitisme n'a pas sa place, ni au Canada, ni ailleurs dans le monde. Our government will always stand with Jewish communities. And Canada's special envoy on preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism, Erwin Kotler, will lead our country's fight against anti-Semitism. On this solemn day, we reflect and learn from the darkest of times, and we recommit ourselves to always standing against hatred, intolerance, and discrimination whenever and wherever it happens. And by doing so, we can bring meaning to the promise, never again. Merci. Thank you. Today marks the 76th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, the most infamous Nazi concentration camp. On this solemn day, as we mourn the inconceivable loss of six million Jews and other innocent victims, we must all recommit to do everything in our power to ensure that such crimes never happen again. Last year, tragically, Canada experienced its fourth straight year of record-breaking anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic incidents. This is alarming Canadians from coast to coast. Canada's Conservatives always stood and will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder 
with the Jewish community in fighting racism and intolerance. Recently, we saw another hateful attack in one of Montreal's largest synagogues. As I've said many times before, racism, hatred, bigotry, anti-Semitism have no place in Canada. It's our moral duty to remember the victims of the Holocaust and to honor the survivors by building a country free of prejudice, racism, and intolerance. On behalf of Canada's Conservatives, I encourage all Canadians to reflect on the events of the Shoah and stand united in fighting against racism. Never again. On this International Holocaust Remembrance Day, we mark the liberation of Auschwitz in 1945, and we honour the memory of the victims of this terrible genocide. The atrocities committed during the Holocaust serve as a constant reminder that we must remain on guard when it comes to defending fundamental human rights and freedoms. Our government will always stand with Ontario's Jewish community. I want to thank the friends of the Simon Wiesenthal Center and their partners for their ongoing work to combat anti-Semitism and hate in all its forms. I also want to commend the strength and the bravery of the survivors who continue to share their stories with us today. May we continue to work together to create a more just and tolerant society in Ontario. Thank you. Hello, Mayor John Tory here. International Holocaust Remembrance Day is a day first recognized by the United Nations in 2005 and falls on the exact day in 1945 when the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camps were liberated. We will never forget this atrocity. We, we must never forget this atrocity, especially all these years later. It is so important that we remember the terrible toll of the Holocaust on so many people across the world. Six million Jewish victims and many others all murdered during the Second World War. These horrific acts represented one of history's most searing examples of hatred, discrimination, inhumanity, genocide. It was evil and it is incumbent upon us to continue to condemn such evil so that it never takes root again. Today, we not only honor the victims of the Holocaust and the survivors and recognize the lasting scars that resulted from it, but pledge to continue informing ourselves and educating future generations. This day must renew our collective commitment to standing against anti-Semitism in all its forms. Our Toronto and Canadian value systems absolutely rejects the hatred, the events, and the violence of the Holocaust. And so let us take today to remember and to honor those who perished and those who survived by rejecting this kind of behavior wherever it still exists. Thank you. Thank you, Special Envoy Kotler, Prime Minister Trudeau, Opposition Leader O'Toole, Premier Ford and Mayor Tory. And thank you again to all of our partners for your support of this evening's program. It is time now to turn to our main program. Michael Berenbaum is the director of the Sigi Ziering Institute, exploring the ethical and religious implications of the Holocaust and a professor of Jewish studies at the American Jewish University. The author and editor of 22 books, he was also the executive editor of the second edition of the Encyclopedia Judaica. He was project director overseeing the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the first director of its research institute and later served as president and CEO of the Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, which took the testimony of 52,000 Holocaust survivors in 32 languages and 57 countries. His work in film has won him Emmy Awards and Academy Awards. Please join me in welcoming Michael Berenbaum. Thank you very much for a very kind introduction. I have to begin by saying that um, the tone set by your national leaders is one to be envied. And that is that there seems to be a unanimity against hate, against bigotry, against racism, against anti-Semitism. 
and a long commitment for uh, remembrance and for mutual understanding. And given the experience that we in the United States have gone through recently, uh, I think you should honor and cherish those words. Uh, and I certainly respect them. Today's January 27th, 76 years ago, Soviet troops liberated Auschwitz and they essentially set the survivors free, who then left Auschwitz, but for many of them, Auschwitz never left them. And I'd like to say, as we explore the consequences of this for education, that in a real sense, the world has not left Auschwitz because the world has not left behind that type of, that type of evil. It would be easy to say never again, but there's too much hatred in the world. It, was easy, it would be easy to say we have learned the lesson, but we haven't learned the lesson because we have repetition. We have racism, we have intolerance, we have genocide, and we have the resurgence of anti-Semitism. My distinguished colleague and respected uh, friend, or when Cutler spoke of denial and revisionism, we live in a world where there is minimization, where there's falsification. And what we experienced very recently in the United States is a danger. And the danger is there are those who want to repeat the crime. So we had a man who walked in and said Auschwitz camp staff member at repetition. We had a man who walked in who wore a shirt which said 6MWE, 6 million wasn't enough. Education on the Holocaust is a deep and important tool for tolerance. It's being used throughout the world as a way of reinforcing what the survivors did, which is to plead for human dignity and human decency, to demand of us responsibility one for another, and to also argue and plead for and embody a sense of commitment to human rights and a sense for the enlargement of human responsibilities so that we truly are responsible one for another. In my work, I declared the Holocaust to be the negative absolute in a world of relativism. We're not sure what's good, we're not sure what's bad, but we're sure that the Holocaust is the embodiment of evil, the paradigm of evil, the evil that we cannot dare repeat and the evil that we must deeply avoid. I'm fond of saying that I have a dream someday that I would be honored to live long enough to be irrelevant. And the reason I could, would love to be irrelevant is because I'd like us to be able to consign the type of venom and the type of hatred, the type of racism and anti-Semitism manifest in the Holocaust to the past. I'd like us to be certain of the future of democracy and I'd like us to say goodbye to polarization and the rise of authoritarianism, but that's not the world in which we live. Those of us who study the Holocaust must remember the perpetrator the men and women who committed the evil that they committed. And we must remember them not as extraordinary people who are demonic, but as ordinary men and women who found themselves capable of committing the most extraordinary of all evil. I disagree with Hannah Arendt who spoke of the banality of evil Evil was not banal, evil was horrific in the most extreme form. But what was evil or what was ordinary was the banality of the evildoer. Ordinary people capable of doing the most extraordinarily evil things imaginable. And we have to avoid that in ourselves and warn ourselves and each other. That's not a direction we have to go. We must understand the victims, the enormous courage that it took to live a day in these camps, the life that was created in the ghetto in the shadow of impending death, the suffering, the anguish, 
the depth, the courage, the moments of compassion and self-help, the heroes of resistance, and most importantly in our generation, the survivors who bore witness to this and to transformed victimization into witness. We must remember the bystanders because evil is empowered by those who do not stand against it. We must also remember the enablers, those who believe that they can tolerate evil because they benefit in another way. And we must remember also people who are called rescuers. They're called in Yad Vashem, the righteous among the nations of the earth, but I like to call them upstanders presented a model of how what human beings can do and how much it takes but also how little it takes but what values it takes and what decency it takes to engage against evil to offer hope to offer a haven to offer a moment of respite and we must commit ourselves very deeply to understand the morality that gave rise to that courage, the morality and the values that get, gave rise to such decency, and the ability to withstand evil. If we do that, then we can begin to understand the evil that took place, the courage to live it, the courage to endure it, and most importantly, the courage to defeat it and the courage also to show us a different human model. We must also express gratitude to the multiple members of the armed forces of the United States, of the Soviet Union, especially on this day of the Soviet Union, to Canada and to all the allies who understood that this was a battle of life and death for democracy, for decency, for the hope of tolerance, and for the hope of respect for all human beings in the world. I wish I could say that Holocaust education had become less demanding, less necessary. I wish we could also say that Holocaust education has demonstrated success by transforming the world. But we who are involved in Holocaust education still believe that if we study this evil, we can learn. If we study this evil, we can learn about decency and learn about goodness. And if we study this evil, we can be what? So horrified by evil that we will try to do good. And if we study this evil, we can understand what it takes to be a decent human being, to accept people for who they are and what they are, and to celebrate the diversity and the vitality of the totality of the human community. We try to do this one by one by one because we know no other way. And this hour has only added to the urgency of our task. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Heather Dun Macadam for her presentation. And having witnessed part of that presentation, I think you're in for a very special treat. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and, uh, and uh, Michael Levitt and uh, merci à vous, uh, Canada, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, I am uh, very inspired by all that your politicians said this evening. Um, I have a presentation and um, we will, I will um, head over to that now. Um, 
So this is not just the uh, 76th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, um, but I wanted to start this evening. Um, this is also the anniversary of the last time that I saw Edith Grossman, who uh, lived in Toronto and is the, um, the inspiration and the narrative spine of my work, 999, uh, the book and the documentary. Um, and I, we lost three survivors from the first transport this year. Um, I've already lit my candle. Um, I hope you will also light your candles in your heart. Um, and uh, oh, so uh, this uh, is Edith. Um, she was uh, 17 when she was on the uh, deported from Humanes, Slovakia. We lost Etta Zimmer Spitz Newman, who was 1755. Uh, she died in Israel this year. Um, she was deported from Poprad and she was 16 years old. And we lost Ella Rutman also from Canada. Uh, her uh, maiden name was Friedman as well, 1950. Uh, and um, we do have five survivors left today. And uh, Regina Schwartz Preter is 96. She lives in America. Laura Spanakoviva. I can never do it. Sorry, the Slovak words. Um, Ritter is 96, living in Slovakia. And Olga Grosova Liktig is in Israel. Um, and uh, part of my work is filming uh, the few survivors who are left. Um, and we just finished um, filming uh, two survivors. Um, Elizabeth Silverman Bentz in Australia. We filmed it remotely and safely uh, via Zoom. Thank God for Zoom. And uh, and Judith uh, Middleman, uh, who is in uh, very near to me. We put on our masks. We kept distant and um, there. So um, we just finished those that filming of those survivors. Originally, I thought I was going to do a documentary. And in the midst of that documentary, I realized that, um, you know, a book, uh, a documentary can only cover so much. A book is much larger. And uh, so I decided to work on the book. The book is done. The documentary we are editing. We're still raising money. Um, it's a much larger project than I thought. Michael, you understand that. And, um, and so... I have created this presentation with excerpts of footage from the documentary that we've edited. Uh, and I'm going to start with that right now. And, uh, and we, I'll be back in a minute. The whole tragedy starts with the girls. In my eyes, the girls were the worst. They have been the first victims. So Eastern Slovakia was where the first transport where the girls were collected from. And this footage are home movies that I found at the Holocaust Museum last year uh, when I was um, on my book tour. And um, this work sort of starts with uh, my first book uh, was written a memoir with Rena Kornreich Gellison. And she was on the first transport. She was Polish, but she was hiding in Slovakia. And she was hiding in the same town that uh, Edith Grossman was from, Humana. And, um, and Adela Gross was this beautiful young woman with bright, bright red hair. And everybody recognized her because of her hair. And, um, and she, uh, Rena witnessed her going to the gas chamber. And the thing that um, really uh, hit Rena about this uh, horrible incident was that Adela was healthy. 
and um, she had flesh on her and she didn't have typhus. And Rena was haunted by why, why did they select Adela to die? And the way Adela went to the gas chamber was helping other young women uh, into the lorries, calming them down. She was just, you know, she had this incredible spirit. And um, the family never knew what happened to Adela. 70 years later, I was in Slovakia, and I'm going to make it a very short story, but um, I connected with a family in Slovakia and in California, and 70 years later, they found out what happened. And that was sort of the light for me in terms of this work, that there were other families out there and that there were stories of not just survivors, but non-survivors. And uh, that has been what I have been uh, really dedicating my life to. So Edith um, was uh, deported with her sister, um, Leah, who was 19 years old. Um, it's important, you know, a major part of this presentation is, is about Slovakia because this first transport um, was very sneaky. And, um, and it, it was very, um, you know, it was classmates, it was childhood friends. And the girls thought they were going to a shoe factory. They thought they were gonna make army boots. And so they, you know, that's that was the line that the government gave them. And uh, I love this photo of Edith um, in her apartment in Toronto. And she's looking at this photograph. This is her school, uh, her class of 1938. And um, and all of these girls, um, I now know the names of these um, these young women because of Edith. Um, this is Edith here, and uh, of the seven Jewish girls in this class picture that were on the first transport, only Edith survived. Um, there are two other Jewish girls in this picture, um, but uh, you know they they hid, they they escaped, um, they they were not deported to Auschwitz. So Edith tells us um, how they woke up one morning and... It was glued on the houses, an announcement that all the Jewish girls, non-married girls from 16 up, have to come to the school on this and this street, the 20th of March, 1942. My parents had two girls arrived to go my mother was so against and, and my father, he was so, so disciplined, you know, he said, it's a law, we have to do it. And my mother said, it's a bad law. And my father said, but it's a law and we have to send those kids. My mother said, hey, you don't have to go or something like, you know. And that was the first time maybe that I disobeyed my mother. So I said, no, I want to go with my friends. Friends are very important at that point. So I, uh, I didn't want to be left behind. So we went uh, to the school and it was a formal checkup, really a formal checkup. And there was something that, it, uh, that we were very surprised and Esses was sitting there. The doctor and the nurses by the table when they were checking with us. So there are lists. Um, this is the first list, and you can see here this is Edith and Leah's names, and this is the street that they lived on. So Edith just told us how they went to the school and they registered for work. And um, and if your name was checked off, um, then you were registered, right? But if your name wasn't checked off, as you can see, Anna and Regina Fridrikova here, um, the police would show up at your, um, at your house or your apartment and uh, escort you to, um, to a train. This was a passenger train, in fact. Um, so this is the first list. Um, I, I just wanted to address also that the footage that uh, some of the footage that you're seeing, we have uh, our um, archival um, uh, reenactments. And one of the movies is The Bride. And that is based on Ladislav Grossman's um, film uh, and book, The Bride. And Ladislav was Edith's husband. Uh, and he wrote the book, The Bride, in honor of his wife. Um, so uh, 
back to what I was saying. So the police would show up and, you know, say, you've got to go. Well, that was the case for Bertha Berkowitz. They told my parents that they were going to take me to work. And uh, there was no other choice. I had to stay, say goodbye to my father and to Hershey. And my mother came with me to the next town, to Capisho. And we stayed there overnight. Of course, nobody slept much. And from there, the next day, we were taken by buses to the city of Stropkov, where all the girls were congregated. There were older girls from our neighborhood. So mother asked them they should take care of me. So I was always with, this, with these girls. I remember my father blessed me. And you know what? I walk around with my father's hands over my head. It's very comforting, very good for me. And they took us out and, and we marched and an SS with us told the parents I began to shout and cry and shout and cry. And my mother, I heard her, I am hearing her now. Oh, she said, about Leia, I am not not so worried she's strong and but Edith she's like nothing. I couldn't understand what was going on because soldiers were lined up on both sides of the street, and, and she was um, among the people having a carrying a luggage that was uh, weighing her down. Um, I have to pause for one second. Um, first of all, I, I um, Lou Gross, uh, who is Adela's cousin, also passed away this year. And um, he is a very important witness. He was four years old when the girls went um, on the on the transport. And I also need to give a shout out to Jeffrey Lautman, um, who is Bertha Berkowitz's uh, son. And he's uh, in the ICU in a COVID unit working right now, but he is watching this. And Jeffrey, thank you for all you're doing to keep people safe. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, so. The girls were collected from towns and villages, right? Um, all across the eastern portion of Slovakia. Bargiov, Stropkov, um, which is Bertha. Humana is where Edith was from. Preshov, Michaelvich, uh, Regina um, Schwartz was from there. And they came on buses and trains, passenger trains. We're not in cattle cars yet. Um, horse carts, trucks, um, you know, parents brought their kids, uh, their daughters. Um, and some of the girls were quite scared. Uh, very young. Uh, Bertha was, you know, just 16. Um, Elizabeth Bentz, it was her birthday. She it was her 16th birthday the day she was deported on March 25th, 1942. Um, so the older girls were encouraging the younger girls and joking and singing songs. And um, Margaret Becker, um, Monsi Becker, who was a very good friend of, of Edith's, uh, they grew up together, uh, recalls that they sang the national anthem on the way to Poprad. Poprad, there was an empty barracks and that's where the girls were collected. Um, and some of them, like Edith, arrived on Friday and was there until they were there till Thursday. Some girls showed up, they were only there less than 24 hours. So the moment they arrived in Poprad, they had a feeling something wasn't up. So something wasn't kosher. Uh, and immediately the, a starvation diet started. Um, they were given potatoes one day, uh, leeks another, cabbage, uh, beans, and uh, six ounces of meat, which was in goulash, once a week. That's the size of a small tin of cat food. And uh, it's about 600 calories a day. Um, they slept in hammocks or on the floor. And um, and they they waited. They didn't know what was going on. There was no information. They had you know absolutely you know they thought maybe this is what the work is, right? So um, one of the things that's so important about this is that um, in slavery uh, you are selling a human being and somebody is purchasing a human being, and generally that 
you, that because it's a monetary transaction, you have a sense of value of that that individual. Hopefully, um, not necessarily. Slavery is has very little um, respect of human humanity, but um, this was they the Slovak government. The Nazis didn't buy the Jews, right? The Slovak government paid the Nazis to take their Jews. It's two hundred Reichmark per person which is about 3,000 USD today. This is one of the most amazing documents. I just got it this summer, um, and it is the original railway invoice. It, um, it came from a, uh, the family found it in their archive of their mother after she passed away. She worked in, uh, the, for a Gestapo member in Auschwitz, and she must have um, confiscated it. Uh, you can see this as Poprad Tatri and Auschwitz, so from and to. Uh, we have here 1,000 people are going to be on the train. There's 999 girls, and there's one doctor. This is the charge. So not only were the Slovaks paying the SS, the Nazis, to take their Jews, they were paying the railway station to deport them. This is the amount for luggage, 360 Reichmark. This is per person. Uh, or, I'm sorry, all of the girls, 3,700 Reichmark. And you can see the date here, March 25th, 1942. So while this document was being prepared by the railway station, there was another document being created. This is the original document in Yad Vashem in Israel. And this is one of the uh, daughters of a survivor of the first transport. And it has every single name of every woman. This is her, this is Orna's mother, Marta Friedmanova from Preshov. Uh, it has the name of every single girl that was on the transport. And uh, part of my work has been to analyze that and discover uh, who survived and who died. And, um, and we will go to the next one. Again, this is the, indicating the typing of the list. You can see Adela, Edith, and Leah all in line together. We had to line up, five in rows, and march to the railroad station. And far away, we saw already a long track cattle cars. We didn't even think of it, that those are suited for us. But we are human beings. The guards started screaming in Slovakia, natural up, up, dirty Jewish horse, and so on. In 2000, trains, we didn't know where we are going. We didn't have any idea. We were about 50 or maybe 60. Not water, not anything, not a little window, and locked from outside. So this is the train journey to Jelena, and then it heads up to Auschwitz. And the train stopped in the middle of a field. There was an empty place at the side, nothing. When we came closer, we saw the barbed wire. And we saw the barracks. We came and marched through an iron gate. The gate opened, top Arbeit macht frei. On the left side was a huge brick building with a huge sim chimney. So we, we whispered to each other, that's the factory where we are going to work. And we just wondered. <laughs> We just wondered what's going to happen to us. We were the first thousand women who ever entered the gates of hell there. Oh, it 
always gets me, um, especially on this anniversary. Um, you know, the fact that they um, thought that the um, provisional gas chamber was um, the factory where they're going to work tells you the kind of innocence, sorry, <laughs> the kind of innocence of these young women. Um, and uh, so um, those of you who've been to the museum, uh, this is uh, an original map from the Auschwitz Memorial Museum. Uh, if you've been to the museum, this is the main entrance where the Arbeck Machrai uh, Iron Gate is and the, the guards. Um, but the women had to walk around here to a separate entrance. Um, they went to Auschwitz I, and there, this red line is indica indicative of a um, barbed wire fence between the men's and the women's camp. And, um, and so this is where they came in. And this is block 10, where was the first block that the women were, uh, the girls were held in. I, um, I have to, I like to say girls because so many of them were teenagers. Um, and, um, and so block 10, uh, this is a uh, block Smerci, block 11. There's the execution wall here. Um, my, uh, uh, Rena Cornwright Gellison used to watch the Russian POWs being executed against the wall. She would peer through the slats of the window and um, and watch them. So this was all blocked off, and um, and we will uh, go. I'm going to show you a little bit of um, this is block ten. So this is not uh, open to the public. Uh, I do get special permission to film and, and to do my research here. Um, and this is the first floor um, and where the uh, bathroom is. There's a, a couple of toilets and some sink uh, sinks. They used to have to go downstairs uh, in the basement to get water. You could lick it from the pipes. Uh, this is the block of his, block elders room, block of a, and her name was Elsa. And this, uh, this long, huge room was um, full of bunks, and at this point, uh, you know, the girls were sleeping one one to a bunk. Um, sisters would stay next to each other. Friends would everybody would try and form a clique and be with their friends. Um, and this is the only photograph that we have historically of a girl that was on the first transport. You can see her number. They started numbering the girls at 1,000, and uh, I do not know her name. We do not know if she survived, um, uh, and uh, they so they came in. They were processed, um, uh, shorn. Uh, Adela Gross, um, the SS, uh, because of her thick red hair, they actually stuck sticks in her hair to see if she had weapons in her hair, and then they shaved her. Um, they shaved everybody, all of your hair, your pubic hair. Your, your hair. Um, and uh, one of the things I think it's really important to remember is that in the Orthodox tradition, and most of these young women were Orthodox, when you get married, uh, you shave your head. And so um, that they were shaving their heads and not married was uh, a yet another um, shaming action against the culture, the Jewish culture. And many of the young women um, were gynecologically examined, about 100 of them uh, virtually uh, hand raped and lost their virginity. And uh, it's something that I write about in the book. I, I won't cover it here. Um, but uh, so the jobs that they did originally in the next footage comes from a film that is called Ostati Atop. It's a Polish film, The Last Stage, and it was filmed in 1948. It was directed and written by a um, Auschwitz prisoner, and, uh, and in it are prisoners, and it is filmed in Auschwitz. So uh, it shows some of the work that they had to do. Um, what it doesn't show is what Edith had to do. Edith and her sister were on the street cleaning uh, um, detail. It started with cleaning snow. And I said to Edith, uh, so did you use brooms or shovels? And she said, no, we used our hands. They forced them to clean, the, to pick up snow off the street with their hands. And she said they were so cold by the end of the day that, um, that she couldn't get out of bed. And her sister made her get up and go eat, uh, absolutely frozen. Um, and uh, and then this, the other um, horrendous jobs, 
that they had these teenage girls do was demolition buildings. So this is this crazy contraption that they had where um, you were pulling it on one side and you were push going to push the wall over. And if this went too far too quickly, it crushed the women on the other side. Many, many young women died in in this in these um these demolition details um ah, the next uh one that you're going to see here is um is the bricks so when they didn't have uh work for them to do they would just give them jobs and they would give a pile of bricks on one side and you would have to throw them over to another pile and then the next day you'd throw them back and you can see here that they um, are reenacting this passing of the bricks. You had to throw them. And, and Rena um, says that um, your hands were blistered and bloody. And, and if you dropped a brick, you got beaten for it. Um, so I'm gonna fast forward uh, now to um, by July, 1942. So the girls arrive in March 25th, 26, 1942. By July 1942, the women's camp is becoming very crowded, and uh, Slovakia is having uh, having um, many more deportations. Um, they did not start selecting prisoners until July 4th, 1942, from the train. So everybody was coming into camp prior to that, um, and and we have um, so what they did for the overcrowding is in the women's camp, that the men's camp was, was not as bad in terms of overcrowding. The women's camp, they took nice sun huts and they put them in between the blocks. And uh, there were no extra uh, toilet facilities though for all of these extra women. So we're talking about over 7,000 women, 8,000 women in July in, in the camp in Auschwitz I. And Himmler, makes a visit and he says, um, you know, to Hess, hurry up and finish building uh, Birkenau. And in August, uh, two weeks, three weeks after Himmler leaves from his inspection, um, the, on August 10th, 1942, the girls wake up, they line up and they march out and they don't know where they're going. They march five kilometers to Birkenau. Now, when they arrive in Birkenau, there's no death gate, right? Birkenau is, it's 319 football fields. I'm going to play this again for you because it, it is absolutely mind boggling. It is so huge. And the women's camp is over here. And sometimes they're working over here in the sauna and in Canada. Walking across there takes about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, when they arrived, there were no train tracks. Um, it was, you know, it was very, very bare bones. Um, and so this is uh, a diagram that we use on um, this um, that I had created. These are the blocks in 1942. The numbers changed, but um, I will show you here. So block 27 was where Bertha Berkowitz uh, stayed. Block 25 was the death block. And that was um, if you were ill, you were taken to the death block and they held you there until they had enough. And then they took you to the gas chamber. That is where uh, Edith's sister died on December 5th, 1942. And Edith was in block 13 and she was able to sneak down to 25. And um, she knew Silka who was in charge of block 25. And I think somebody gave her a hand, um, armband and she was able to sneak in to see her sister twice before she passed away. She was in a coma. Um, so um, this is what the blocks look like inside. You can see these are koyas. Um, you didn't want to sleep on the floor, right? Because there were rats everywhere. Um, in the worst of it, uh, they were. you would have 10 or 12 girls uh, at a time sleeping on these shelves and um, hygiene was terrible and the lice who were infected with typhus could crawl back and forth very easily and infect people. So there was a huge typhus epidemic and many, many young women died of typhus in, in 1942. Um, the selections started in 
uh, August, uh, I believe it was August 15th. It's actually not written in the documents, um, documentation when the selections began of prisoners. Um, the death records for women are almost non-existent. They didn't keep death records on uh, women until um, I think it's uh, late 1942, 1943. These are all faces of girls that died. Um, we know um, the one that I know for sure, uh, Rosa Zimmerspitz was, um, was tried to escape and she was tortured and executed with three of her sisters. Uh, Leia, we know, died of typhus. Um, Magda Amster died on the same day as Leia uh, on December 5th, 1942, also of typhus. Um, and uh, I'm going to fast forward now because I want to talk about liberation. And, um, and so uh, 1945, January 18th, uh, there was a death march out of Auschwitz because the Russian front was coming. And uh, and many prisoners who shouldn't have <laughs> gone on the death march because they were ill or um, disabled, like Edith. Edith had bone tuberculosis in her leg and and limped. Um, decided to go on the death march in, because they were told. The rumor was that the um, SS were going to lock uh, the camp uh, Birkenau and uh, put a uh, gas. Um, and ignite it uh, around the perimeter and ignite it. And actually the SS man with that job decided not to do it. Um, so many people went on the death march in order to um, avoid dying in uh, Auschwitz. And one of the, um, Linda Reich Brader uh, says that one of the hardest things about the death march was uh, seeing girls that you that had survived almost three years in Auschwitz die on the death march. Um, the other thing was absolute. It was a blizzard and it was, they were starving. They were so hungry. Um, so they, um, these are the different tracks of, um, uh, that they walked. Most of the women walked um, to Wojciechowski and there they picked up trains. Um, one of my, one of the women, um, Edith Rose, ends up in Mauthausen, but most of them ended up in Ravensbrück and then from there end up elsewhere. Um, also, prior to this, Bertha Berkowitz, um, she was uh, deported to Bergen-Belsen in uh, end of October, actually probably with Anne and Margot Frank. Um, but I think that was October 31st, 1942. So she was already in Bergen-Belsen. Um, so then, uh, 76 years ago today, uh, Auschwitz was liberated, but I don't know of anybody on the first transport that was actually in Auschwitz. Um, at that time, they had mostly all gone in the death march. So um, these are women um, leaving uh, after liberation. Uh, you can see the amount of snow that was that had been dumped in that past week. It was bitter cold, and and many many people died after the liberation of Auschwitz in Auschwitz itself because so many people were ill um, that had stayed there. Um, but let's talk about the liberation of Europe now, okay? Because that's coming into the future 76 years ago. And Ber uh, Bertha Berkowitz, this is Bertha here. I'm sorry, somebody's coming into my house and that's my dog barking. <laughs> sorry. Um, this is Bertha on the uh, April 19th in the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. And this is her a couple of days later looking much healthier. Um, and she is showing British uh, um, soldiers. She's just taken them down to the death pits where bodies were um, dumped. Um, this is Ida Eigerman, and she is um, in a dis displaced persons camp. We found this photograph at the JCC, and uh, one of her daughters was like, oh, my God, I think that's my mother. And um, sure enough, her mother was always knitting, and it's the same photograph that we have uh, for her passport photo. Um, women dispersed all over the place. They didn't all go home to Slovakia. Um, this is Rena and Danka Kornreich, who I wrote my first book about. Um, after, you know, they knew not to go back to Poland. They knew there was nobody to go back to. So they went to Holland and they lived there until they emigrated to America. This is one of my favorite stories of liberation. So um, these, uh, these women here, 
Um, I know of three that were on the first transport. This is uh, Mar Marta Mengel, and this is Fanny and Etta Zimmerspitz. Uh, Etta is one of the ones that just passed away this year. Um, they made it to Prague, and um, there were no trains left. And so um, they were going to walk home to Slovakia. And these men were Polish and Czech men escorted these young women home to Slovakia so that they would be safe on their journey home. I think that's just such a beautiful story. And then um, some of our women ended up in uh, Sweden. And uh, this is a really interesting story. We don't really have time to cover it tonight, but this photograph was taken um, in uh, May 4th, 1945, 10 Days in Freedom. This is Ella Rutman here and her sister um, Edith, uh, not Edith Grossman, and their other sister, Lily. Um, one of the things that I, um, I, I want to close with this evening um, is that uh, last year, Edith told me a story that she didn't tell me when I was writing the book, and I wish she had about liberation. When you are a woman and you arrive in Auschwitz, um, within a few weeks, your period stops. And um, it is one of the most difficult things because as Edith said, uh, they didn't, they shaved us, they didn't want us to look like women and they didn't want us to feel like women. So losing your period uh, was a sign that you were no longer a woman. You didn't feel like a woman anymore. When Edith was liberated, um, she had been in a, uh, a, been able to eat for a couple of weeks prior to that. And the day um, Europe was liberated, she got her period. And she said that she was leaping around, shouting, I'm a woman again, I'm free. I'm a woman again, I'm free. So let's remember um, the importance of liberation and retrieving our humanity um, and for women, retrieving our uh, femininity. Thank you, everybody. Okay. I've been on. Okay. okay. First of all, Heather, it's, uh, it's a... Um, Tell us a little bit as to how you got involved in this and why you got involved in this and what it's done to you. Tell us the journey oh, of the God. author and filmmaker because you don't touch this material for free. No. Um, you know, I always say if you're going to, um, if a Holocaust survivor says, will you please write my story, um, you better say yes. <laughs> so. Um, it, uh, you know, I met Rena and, you know, I fell in love with her. I just, the moment I met Rena, we were like clicked. And, and it was the same with Edith. The absolute moment. I, I have such a, um, I don't know, there's just something in my heart that connects to these young women. Um, probably because I was a, you know, young woman, a 16 year old. And, um, and I, I really relate to their story. And, um, and so, that started the journey and you know uh i went i went to auschwitz um on the 70th anniversary um of uh the, the deportation of, of the girls um i went to poprad and uh, and and took a train up to auschwitz because i wanted to experience that and um and that's where I learned that Edith, I, you know, I didn't know that there were any other um, survivors from the first transport. And discovering that was um, suddenly, you know, I, I realized that I had more questions. And most of those questions were based on the deportation in Slovakia and that history. And then Edith knew so many girls from the first transport. It just kept, it just kept unfolding. And then families have contacted me over the years and, um, uh, it's just it's great work. I love I love finding lost girls because they uh, disappear. 
let me touch on a couple of things that um, sort of scattered. I think that um, we all should know one thing about Slovakia. You mentioned there were two unique aspects of Slovakia. Slovakia is the only country that paid the Germans to deport the Jews. They weren't. Uh, they didn't realize that uh, the Germans would have gladly deported the Jews on their own, and they paid the Germans to deport them. Slovakia also um, was headed by a Roman Catholic priest, was its president, Father Tiso. And it's remarkable that Father Tiso was never excommunicated by the Vatican, not before, not, not during, and not after. And even um, when Pope John um, Paul II made a whole range of things that um, Roman Catholic priests could not hold secular political offices, nobody said anything about the role that Father Tiso uh, played. I want to touch on uh, a couple of small things with you. Um, women losing their periods was, uh, you, you captured it very nicely. Uh, and that is that they had a sense of lost womanhood. They did not know that starvation and pressure, uh, long distance runners lose their periods. Uh, starvation and intense pressure causes that to happen. It's one of the ways in which they return to life. It's also one of the reasons after the war that many survivor women want to marry and get pregnant immediately because they didn't believe that they could ever give birth. And when they did give birth, it was an extraordinary sense of, of fulfillment. Um, I want to- Michael. Uh, go ahead, please. Just as right. Right on that, this is really fascinating. I met um, last year when I was on my book tour, um, somebody told me um, that many of the, the survivors, uh, because they were so young, they got pregnant without ever having had their period. So they well, didn't they, even know what it was yet. They, they didn't know. They, that's, they also remember after the war, they had um, several things that were very important. Where do you go? Who do you have? What's left? How do you find those who are lost? And um, you desperately needed a certain sense of stability. And some of them spoke of childbirth as having someone they could love and touching mm -hmm. innocence in all that that meant. And there's a a uh, statistic that historians know, which is the high, highest birth rate in all of Europe in the year after the Holocaust was in the displaced persons camp. That essentially um, these women returned to life and they dared to bring new life into the world without knowing where their future was, what life would bring, where they were going to go, what they were going to do. But there was an instinct that in the aftermath of death, you uh, recreated uh, life. Let me uh, ask you a question. Uh, women survivors. Let me just add one thing. Hold on. So, one thing about that I do not know a single uh, woman from the first transport who did not miscarry. Or um, Edith actually had to have an interruption because she was too ill. She got pregnant, and an interruption was with the terminology for an abortion. So, um, sure. is um, I know uh, Margaret Becker uh, was pregnant with twins, and she lost both of them. Yeah, it, it it. So, the longer you were in Auschwitz, the harder it was to have children, and um, and and many of the women couldn't. Um, uh, Martha, the, um, the young woman, born a who I um, showed in the film looking at the list, she was adopted and she didn't find out she was adopted until after her mother passed away and her mother had been sterilized in Auschwitz. Prisoners understood the longer you were there, the harder it was. Uh, and they had a vocabulary, they called them the low numbers. Low numbers developed a tremendous amount of respect among the prisoners 
because it meant that they had survived winter after winter after winter. And you showed it with the snow on the grounds of Auschwitz after libera right at, at liberation. But you have to understand that they went through the winter and you, in, I'm in Los Angeles, so we have a mild winter, but you in Toronto and in Canada have a strong winter. Imagine going through that, essentially being able to wear pajamas only and having no, um, no um, uh, form of real nourishment or warmth and you begin to understand what it took. I want to focus uh, on one other thing, which um, survivor women talk about camp sisters, about the family that they developed among themselves and the way in which they supported each other and brought each other up when they were really down. And women more than men talk about the fact that they couldn't have survived alone. They were helped by being together. By the way, helped and also in certain respects hurt because they took chances they would not have taken on uh, on their own, but for each other. Did you find much discussion of that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Edith, after her sister dies, um, doesn't feel like um, she can go on, and uh, and that uh, um, her, she has a friend Elsa, who you know, becomes her lager sister, her camp sister, and um, won't let her give up, will not let her give up. And it's absolutely essential. And, and in the death march, um, Irina Fine was a very good friend of Edith's. And, um, and Irina speaks about, uh, so Irina had um, a frostbite and she lost two of her toes. And, um, and she talks about Edith on the death march saying, I can't do it, I can't do it. And 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 Irina grabs uh, Edith and says, "I have no toes. I'm going to do it." And and drags her, you know. And um, and I said to Edith, you know, do you remember this? And she said, "Uh, no, not at all." But you know, that's one of the things I find so fascinating about um, these multiple narratives pulling them together because I, you know, Edith doesn't remember that story because it was, you know, it was. The death march. She was starving and, and tired, and but there's Irina saying that about Edith, and so you get a whole much larger photo picture of, of what was going on. There, there also was there also was a concentration camp language for that. Uh, they called them Muslimaner. Mus Muslimaner was uh, Muslims, and the reason Muslims is because Muslims lie prostrate. They pray with absolutely prostrate. And it meant, in one sense, that's the moment at which you hit the bottom. And either somebody pulled you up from that and encouraged you and brought you back, or else you just hit bottom and there was nothing left. And so it, it was also took courage for a survivor to go next to someone who had given up, or a prisoner to go next to someone who had given up, because the distance in everybody's life between giving up and going on was very, very small, very narrow. And you were afraid that despair would be catchy. It would be like a disease yeah. that you would just give up. So most people withdrew at that moment and the affection, the love, the esteem, the friendship was something that forced them to, um, that, that allowed them to draw close at that moment. There's a whole theory of this by Viktor Frankl, who said that um, uh, was himself a survivor of, of Tresenstadt and Auschwitz, who said that essentially um, you needed someone to care for and to be cared for by. You needed a sense of meaning in order to contain yourself and, and bring yourself together. A word about death marches also, which is that Death marches um, were, in Nazi terminology, forced evacuation, and they were designed to make sure that there weren't witnesses available when the uh, Soviet troops came in. For the survivor, it was a step. They didn't know it was a step either to death or to liberation. They didn't know which. And the other part of it that was incredible is it was... Um, the moment at which the enemy was as much internal as external. 
do you have enough within you to walk through the wall of exhaustion, hunger, starvation, and for women especially also, um, how do you go to the bathroom? If you pause, you're in trouble. If you don't pause, you're in trouble. And it is a, a test of endurance. The and and then at the end you get no reward. At the end you just come to another camp, and conditions in the other camp were even more difficult because they were overrun. So it's an incredible it's an incredible sense of, of uh, testimony as to how people had the elementary, primitive, deep powerful urge to live and their youth helped them enormously yeah linda um reich brader speaks about when they get to robinsbrook and it's so overcrowded it, edith says that they they sat in bees um you know in between each other's legs and leaned against each other that's how crowded it was and linda reich brader says that um they brought the kettle of soup and uh and there were so many people, so many people being hungry, so many women being hungry that they um, they ran into ran to the kettle and it fell over, and the soup went all over and froze on the ground. And she said they were on their hands and knees licking the soup that had become ice. That's how hungry they were. And um, in that blizzard in the Death March, their uh, clothes, of course, you know, snow is wet, so their clothes are soaking wet right and icy and and then they're put on uh cattle on in coal cars when they get to vajasasaski they um they put the women in coal cars and um and many of them died of overexposure um it was so cold and uh rena talks about being in the coal car they're, they're so thirsty that she takes the snow off the very bridge and licks it that's the only way they can get water. So, um, yeah, and and uh, Linda Brake Brader also says that, you know, that was one of the things that if a girl died in the coal car, they took her clothes. They And they she said we knew that she would want us to take her clothes so we could stay warm and survive and say what happened. So, um, you know, I think for many survivors like Edith, um, it's, um, and it, it, it is the message of you know, the survivor. Why did we survive? To tell, to tell the story. And Edith's big message for the world is that war serves no one. You know, it just doesn't work. Everybody dies, <laughs> everybody loses something. And, and Rena, um, th her message, the same thing is that, you know, we, we have to take care of each other. We, you know, COVID is our is our great equalizer here. Anti-Semitism makes no sense. It's illogical because we're all human beings. First and foremost, we're human beings, and and what you believe and what I believe um, is is personal, and um, and the this idea that um, that we should be against each other for any single reason. Uh, you know, Rena just couldn't get it. She didn't understand how anybody could um, could be against another human being. You know, one of the great contributions of survivors has, has been to remind us of the most basic of human values. And what you've just yeah. reminded us in a very real sense is that most basic human value that um, we are human beings and we share more in common than we like to. I want to conclude by saying one thing, Heather, which is praise to you, because one of the things you've done in this work is to reunite the scattered fragments of experience and brought them out to a new generation in a double way that they can experience in words and in film, in a book. And an incredible thing at the end of long lives for some of these women, you've been able to piece the story together and bring them back as one to be able to bear witness. And for that, we thank you. Thank you, Michael. That 
praise indeed from somebody who's written 22 books <laughs> and finished your films. Um, yeah, I, I, um, it, it's a big, it's well, a huge my, honor. My advice, on, my, advi my advice on that, my advice on that, um, and on the films is a very simple piece of advice. Um, the most difficult yeah. thing for a parent is to, is to let a child go out into the world. <laughs> you never finish a book, you abandon a book. And <laughs> you never quite finish, you never quite finish a film, you just allow it to be seen by others. <laughs> thank you. Michael and Heather. Thank you both so much on behalf of Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center and all of our partner organizations for giving us this absolutely incredible evening of conversation. <clears throat> I think you've really reaffirmed the importance uh, of making sure that these voices carry on. Uh, have a platform for these voices and uh, we continue to learn these lessons from incredible individuals. The passion that you both bring to the work is absolutely remarkable and came through the screen tonight full, full throttle. <laughs> um, I would like to take a second to acknowledge the number of Holocaust survivors that also joined us this evening uh, for this program. Again, their courage and sharing their testimony and, and speaking out um, is recognized and uh, we're so appreciative of, of all of their efforts. Um, I do want to take a second to recognize Jordan Desai, the education team and the great Wiesenthal staff that all helped to put this evening's program together. Um, our port partner organizations, of course, uh, for, for supporting this program and, and helping us build a great audience. Uh, our chairman, Fred Wax, uh, our honorary chairman, Jeremy Schwar uh, sorry, Jerry Schwartz, uh, as well as all of the lay leadership that uh, leads our organization and empower to put programs like this together. Finally, thank you to everyone who tuned in this evening to be a part of this conversation. Um, we're so pleased to see the attendance and the acknowledgement of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.